For some reason, some users think that there's no need to add constraints to the first component. And if you take a look at this assembly, it looks okay in the graphics area, but then when you take a look at the model tree, you can see that there are some symbols next to the names of the components. And those are actually called glyphs. If we take a look at the first component, it has an empty box next to it. That means that the component is either unconstrained or underconstrained. And all the other components have a double box next to them, indicating that they are assembled to something that is under constraint. And luckily, this is a very easy fix. All you have to do is select that first component, edit definition, and here we can see that right now there are no constraints. You can add the default constraint from this drop down list or from the drop down list in the ribbon, or you can right mouse click and hold and choose default constraint. And Usually, probably 95 or 98 percent of the time or more, the first component is going to be assembled with the default constraint, unless it may be assembled to some assembly datums or to some skeleton geometry. But we have the default constraint, hit the check mark, and now when you take a look at the model tree, we don't have any of those glyphs next to the components. Design in context is a very powerful modeling technique and it's useful for complex assemblies. And what that means is you are going to create your components in the assembly and create the geometry while you have the assembly open and you're locating the components where they are actually going to be physically located in the assembly. So what I mean by that, for example, we have this assembly, let's create a component and it's going to be a part and let's give it a number. And I'm going to click OK. And we'll use our default template. And for locating it, I'm just going to use the default constraint to locate it at 0, 0, 0. And we've got it placed in the model. Now I can select it and activate it. And for the geometry that's going to be in this part, let's say I want to create an extrude and I'm going to sketch on this surface here. Maybe it's going to be some kind of plug for those holes. And now I can use the project command and grab a couple of those semicircles. And let me change to the line command and I'm just going to create a line from there to there and from there to there and let's hit the check mark and type in a value for the depth and hit the check mark again so now we have our part created, and again, we created it in the assembly where it needs to go. Now, this is a very simple part. If I open it up in its own separate window and turn on the display of my datum planes and coordinate systems, you'll notice that the geometry is located off in space away from our default datum planes and our default coordinate system. So sometimes you might want that, but again, for very simple parts, there's really no need for that. Just create it in its own separate window and locate it relative to the default datum planes and default coordinate system. One reason that people like this technique a lot is that uh, a lot of times they'll def figure out where the components are supposed to go and define them some distance off from this default coordinate system so that when they go to assemble all the different components together, then they can just use the default constraint for all the components. And that really isn't good because you're defeating the parametric nature of Creo Parametric because if we have a big change to our models, if we have a big change to our assemblies, like this whole assembly needs to get bigger or smaller, then we would have to go into each one of those individual parts and change the geometry so everything would be located in the right place. Whereas if we had designed the parts, 
and use assembly constraints, then when we make big changes, the other components are going to relocate as necessary. Designing with external references is powerful when it's done correctly, but when it's done incorrectly, you can end up with a lot of different problems. And I can tell that this particular assembly has a lot of external references because right now I can see in the notification center that we have a circular reference. And that's one of the really bad things that can happen with external references where you have one component that is both the parent and child of another component and the more circular references that you have the longer your models can take to regenerate to investigate the external references in this model we can go to the reference viewer and you can access it from the model tab over on the side it's also available on the tools tab and you can also right click components or the top node of the model tree and go to information reference viewer and when it pulls up one thing i notice is that all right right now it's missing a model it's looking for a couple of references from the cb22 assembly which is probably the next higher assembly so components in this assembly have references to the next higher level assembly and i can actually see that there are 13 feature references and one system reference and the notification center told us there was a circular reference here we see the different circular references and i can see that all right there's a circular reference essentially between the head component the lower push rod cover and the lifter block and if you select these different things you can see okay now we have some other ones between and it looks like the heads is a very big culprit in here and a bunch of other different components and again if you click on the different ones in here can show you the nature of the issues and so if i take a look at that component here i happen to see it in the model tree i can go to information and reference viewer to look at its particular information we can see that this part has two external references to the cylinder part and you can see that's referencing a protrusion in there and four external references to components in the actual engine and it's those push rod cover components uh, let's go close this one and a, another component that uh, I notice had a bunch of different issues with it. Uh, let's go and select this part over here. And again, information reference viewer. And again, we can see that this one has uh, references to a missing model and also has external references to some datum planes and a protrusion from the new manifold part. So again, External references are great when you do them properly. And the other thing about using external references, if you do want to reference a higher level assembly, there really should be a skeleton model in here that uses data sharing features to grab those references from the higher level assemblies or parallel level assemblies. And then the components that need to make external references really should have data sharing features in them like copy geometry features or shrink wrap features. Uh, here we see the push rod covers parts. And again, here's the heads part. If I expand it in here, you can see all the different features and I don't see any data sharing features in here like again copy geometry or shrink wrap which really should be used to grab the necessary references from those other different parts because then you're avoiding having direct external references and you also have the update control if you want to permanently or temporarily break those external references I hope you enjoyed this video. For more information, please visit www.creowindchill.com. If you learned something from this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this video, please click the subscribe button to be informed when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.